Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and today we do Africa, the ancient world to 1500. We start in East Africa. We start in East Africa. East Africa is as old as Egypt is. It will develop right along with it. When I talk about East Africa, we're not talking about the coast. We are talking about the Nile. And this is going to extend well down through what we call the Sudan today into what was called Kush. And these are along the cataracts of the Nile. We're going to have a bunch of kingdoms that pop up here. Napata, Mero, Kush. The idea is that these kingdoms develop alongside Egypt because they have a trade relationship and they have a cultural relationship with the Egyptians. The Egyptians need stuff, metal, minerals, during the first intermediate period, mercenaries. So they need to negotiate with someone. They need to negotiate with a king. Kings negotiate with kings. They don't negotiate with chiefs. And so... Kush's civilization is growing just as fast. They have kings. They have infantry armies. They provide mercenaries. They fight each other a lot. Um, in the Sudan, there are uh, small pyramids, personal burial pyramids. You can see that there's the, obviously what happened is, Kushites went to Egypt, saw the pyramids, came back, said, oh, you have to see this, drew what it looked like, and they went, oh, we'll draw it, we'll make them. But they had less resources, they were less wealthy than Egypt, than the pharaohs of Egypt were. Um, and so they built smaller ones, they still built personal pyramids. They'll be conquered by New Kingdom Egypt, which will again bring more and more trade, uh, bring more culture connection between them and the Egyptians uh, and through the Egyptians to the outside world. But they also take over Egypt. Kush takes over Egypt and becomes the 25th dynasty around 945 uh, BC and will own, will run Egypt for a generation. And they're accepted as pharaohs. They are the 25th dynasty. They'll be kicked out by the Assyrians uh, about a generation or two later. Further south than Kush, we get Nubia, we get Mero, we get Ethiopia. These kingdoms are going to have a connection to the Roman world. So notice, east, the Nile provides a connection to the Mediterranean. The Nile provides these connections, cultural, economic, social connections. The thing is, is that East Africa, and we'll see this again with West Africa, is at the end of those connections. It is not itself the center of them. It's at the end of a long string, and sometimes that string gets cut. So we get the introduction of Christianity. Christians will come um, south, up the Nile. Uh, lots of Christian, Christian um, monks and ascetics, people who want to get away from it, uh, want to get away from the Roman world, they'll end up in Ethiopia. They'll end up because this is the end of the world on their maps. Um, mercenaries. The Romans are perfectly willing to hire Africans. There's no racism in the ancient world. And so mercenaries, African mercenaries, come down the Nile, hire themselves out into Roman armies. And again, resource trade, mostly minerals. We're going to see this a lot. Minerals are going to constantly be shipped um, north to the Mediterranean and Middle Eastern world. So Nubia, Mero, Ethiopia, they will all be the Roman, whereas Cush had Egyptian connections, these places will have Roman connections. The Islamic conquest in the 600s cut off East Africa from the Roman world. And so their connections to Christianity become tenuous. The Red Sea coast, especially Somalia, 
was tied right across to Arabia. And so what we start to see is Islam. Islam in Egypt brings brings Islam up up the Nile. Islam comes over the Red Sea via trade to Somalia and to the coast of East Africa. Uh, only the Ethiopian highlands remains Christian. And that's because they're hard to get to. They're up in the mountains. So they continue to be an ortho, what we would call Orthodox Christian. They would just call it Christian. But they're cut off from the Orthodox world, from Constantinople, from the Roman world. Um, so they will remain Christian, which will freak out Europeans like the Portuguese when they show up in the 1500s. Because when they show up in the 1500s, they're going to show up and say, all of you people are Muslim. We get to beat you all up. And these people are going to raise their hand and go, uh, we're Christian. And they're like, yeah, that's nice. No, you're not. Like, yeah, we have a Bible. Like, what? What? Eh, oh, here's a crucifix. We got Jesus. Like, what? Wait, what? But you're African. And like, yeah. And, uh, who's this Pope dude? Like, when did that happen? Like, well, actually that happened around 1054. It's pretty recent, actually, you know, it's Italy. And, and so the Africans are going to be like, hey, we're better Christians than you guys are. We're older school because they didn't change. They didn't develop. They didn't do all the things that happens to European, Western European Christianity, much less the disaster that happens to Orthodox Christianity because of the Islamic conquests. They're cut off. And so their developments are local developments. Uh, what you end up with is a lot of um, religious warfare between the coast and the interior. We'll see this a lot in West Africa too. Um, and But this warfare is not just political. It also takes on a religious notion between Islam and Christianity. So the better educated, better tied to world trade guys on the, on the coast are Muslims and they are going to make war upon and mostly win against various different Christian peoples on the interior. And those Christian peoples will eventually convert because why wouldn't you? There's no reason to stay um, Christian. You lost, you know. And so the people who stay Christian are up in the highlands, they're up in the mountains. They're hard to get to. They, they're not conquered. So... East Africa gets tied to the Middle East now by trade, mineral wealth. Again, a lot of gold, a lot of silver and coffee. Coffee is big because a lot of Muslims, a lot of Arabs are uh, aesthetics. They're taking all the guys who took their religion seriously, do a lot of prayers. They need to stay awake. They're reading their, their Korans into the, to the late night. And so they, they need a stimulant. And here comes coffee. Coffee is always big. Um, Mind-altering drugs are always big in religious communities. Always. Because they help you get in touch with your, your divine soul, divine being. So, one is trade. The second relationship is slaves, slavery. And this will go on until the 20th century. Some 10 million people will be conquered in the interior of Africa, shipped to the coast, and then shipped to the Middle East. Now, after a few generations, they will become Muslims, and they will become part of that society. They'll be get absorbed into that society. So you could still see it in Arab societies today in the Middle East. You have Arabs who are very, very white, and you have Arabs who are very, very dark. Well, why? Well, there's that mixture going on. You have Arabs who are brown. You have in America, we go, oh, the Middle Easterners are all brown, but they're not. They're 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 not. They never have been. They are this simply race is not simply the same thing as it is in America, and it's not defined the same way. Um, those 10 million Black Africans are brought into the Middle East and are assimilated over a couple of hundred years, and um, 
their genetics goes through that population. So some people are brown, some people are dark, black, um, some people are still white. So they're a whole mix of people. Uh, mercenaries. So if they're not slaves, they're also being hired as mercenaries. Africans are always good soldiers. They're good at war and they fight a lot. And so they're good at infantry. They don't have the horses. A lot of this has to do with the um, environment, the geography of Africa, that um, horses don't do very well or didn't do very well in Africa. Um, the heat, the diseases, the bugs... So African infantry, now there's also Nubian cavalry. That's North African cavalry. That's, that's Sahara level cavalry. Those guys are excellent. Uh, that's West Africa. In the East, we're still dealing with infantry, just like we did with the, the Egyptians. And that's to offset Arab cavalry. The Arabs are horse people. The Arabs ride around on horses all day, so they're not going to fight on foot. Um, so they hire African mercenaries to do it for them. Because if you're going to fight Europeans, or if you're going to fight infantry, you need infantry to fight infantry. Like, horses can do well, but if all you have is horses, you can either ride up and shoot them with your arrows, at which point they put up their shields, or you have to charge into them, at which point they put up their spears. Like, you need infantry distracted by fighting other infantry for horses to really be at an advantage. And so the Arabs are perfectly willing to hire uh, African mercenaries, pay them well, ship them to the Middle East, use them in war. The effect of this is, is that Africa, East Africa, becomes one third of the Indian trade network. There's an entire Indian trade network that goes from China through India to Africa and from Africa through India to China and from India to Africa and China. It is... Um, African raw materials, Ar Arabic manufacturers, Indian luxuries, Indian and Chinese luxuries, all being tied together. So the places on the coast are wealthy, are rich. I know the, the, the entire story of, of Africa is, oh, it's a poor place that white people had to conquer because it sucks. It's just not true. That's all racism from 1500 to 1900. It just doesn't exist that way. And that's what this, this lecture is about. It's about the reality. East Africa was tied through trade into the Indian educational, cultural, um, economic world. And it was part of it. So East Africa is rich. It's educated and it's independent. Other countries, other do not come and conquer. It, uh, East Africa does not become part of the Arab world, the same way, say, Southeast Europe does, or North Africa does. This means Africans become part of the Muslim world, which stretches from Eastern Africa all the way in the south near Ma Ma uh, Madagascar, all the way to Kazakhstan, all the way to Morocco, tens, millions of acres, tens of, uh, you know, probably what, five, 6,000 miles north, 4,000 miles east to west. It's a massive world where you were a part of the Muslim world. You, even though you were a different race and a different culture, um, you were the same religion and you had these things in common. And so you could be part of any of these peoples stretching f all the way from the Himalayas to the jungles of the rainforest of Central Africa. All right, so that's going to bring us to West Africa, and that will be our next lecture. We're going to split these two up, make them nice and short. So in our next, next lecture, we're going to do West Africa, the kingdoms of West Africa, and the Sahara.